So Alessandro badgered me into giving this talk. It has very little social impact and probably even less network science. Uh, it has no vision. It's all retrospective. So I don't know why he calls this vision. And worst of all, there's no Bellinis before the talk, which is something he promised. Um, OK, so this talk is something that I actually gave a couple of months ago Okay. Uh, at the 80th birthday of Dick Karp, uh, who's an eminent scientist known to many of you. And uh, I gave this talk really to recap what I learned from him over 30 years. Uh, and there are many in the audience here who've been heavily influenced by him. Uh, and um, so, okay. So uh, here's five things I learned from Dick. Each one will be illustrated by a two-slide anecdote or technical anecdote. Uh, there won't be lots of deep proofs here. But in each, I've attempted to draw a, an, an inspiration. And along the way, uh, I'll, I'll uh, mention a few people who unfortunately are not here with us today. Okay. Um, the, the first thing that uh, those of you who have known for many years uh, will recall is that uh, he always went for the simple. And the example I'm going to give you is an epitome of this style because if you look at the internet for what I'm about to show you, you'll find literally dozens of incredibly painful, difficult analyses. Uh, and what Cobb showed us in a lecture was elegantly simple, and one that I've never seen written down by him anywhere. And this is just the analysis of quicksort. Okay? And again, I urge you to go check on the internet for analysis of quicksort. You'll find tons and tons and tons of really painful uh, ways of analyzing quicksort. Okay, so you're talking about randomized quicksort. You're trying to sort n numbers. You pick a random element from there and compare every element in the set to that random element. And so you have a bunch of things that are bigger than the random splitter and a bunch of things smaller. Okay? And then you recursively sort each half. That's all. This is basic. Every one of us learns this somewhere in the first year of computer science. Um, and there's no shortage of analysis. Uh, on the web that you'll find in class notes from people about how you say a splitter is good if it's pretty balanced, otherwise you throw it away and then you try again and so on. In fact, you don't have to do any of that, right? So what are we after here? We're looking at the expected number of comparisons in a run of quicksort and we'll be able to write down an expression for this, okay? Uh, the, the key observation is when you split, once you split, in a run of quicksort, nothing in the smaller set is ever compared to anything in the bigger set. So the twain shall never meet again. And that's all that you need to, to finish writing down the expression for the expected number of comparisons in one slide. And here's how it goes. Okay? Uh, let's just assume we're sorting the numbers 1 through n. Okay? And this is pretty gentle. So here are handwritten cl uh, class notes from Karp's lectures about 83. And it never got written down until uh, I co-authored a book much later, and I was surprised at this. And recently, I think it was in Stack Overflow, there was a heated debate on who originally came up with this. Uh, and Avram Blum pipes in at some point and says, well, it was Motwani and Raghun. In fact, it was not us. It was Karp's class notes. Okay. All right, so, so here's the, the key observation. Take i not equal to j. Okay. Uh, these two are compared in a run, run of quicksort if and only if one of them is chosen as the splitter before anything between i and j. Okay. That's the key observation. Okay. So this event occurs with probability 2 divided by j minus i plus 1. Think of j as bigger than i. Okay. And then it's just linearity of expectations. You set up an indicator variable. That's 1 if i and j are compared, 0 otherwise. Okay. And so the probability that indicator variable is 1 is what we just wrote down. So the expectation of xij is what I just said. Summing this over all i less than j gives you that summation. That's an equality. Okay. Uh, you don't need to do painful uh, analyses throwing away large constant factors. And the, the model I want to take away from this is too often in analyzing algorithms, we are in a hurry to say, well, the intuition says that we can throw away this constant factor and that and so on. And, and we can get an analysis that's you know, 10,000 times off the right analysis. And 10 times as long. Uh, the point of this is sometimes by thinking a little harder and getting to the root of the problem structure, we can actually do much better. And this was a simple example, okay, and one that 
you, you know, it was very, very typical of the things that Dick taught us. Okay. Uh, there's probably no modern exponent of algorithms and the power of randomization who's had a more powerful impact on the field than Dick Karp. Okay. And I could go on for several hours, maybe a semester, talking about his many different ideas uh, for using the power of randomization. Now, you could say, well, randomization as a technique was known to statisticians in many, many ways, including MCMC and so on. So what's new here? I think what's new here is that for lots of problems that we found hard to solve, uh, Dick and his ideas on randomization gave us ways that were simple, easy to implement, and in many cases more efficient. Okay? Uh, the particular example I'm going to pick for you, again in a couple of slides, uh, has to do with one of his, the papers he co-authored, and it has to do with this problem called randomized caching. Now, those of you who are around in the 90s uh, will remember this uh, algorithm. So let me set it up for you. This has to do with the competitive analysis of caching, right? So we have something called a cache and a parameter k that is the size of this cache, the number of things it can hold, right? And then you have a request sequence that's presented to you demanding one item at a time. And if the requested item is in the cache, you get it for free. So you get to keep some items in cache, okay? Otherwise, you pay a miss. And what we're going to look at is how many misses you pay, okay? And when, once you miss, the caching algorithm must evict something in the cache and pull something in from the outside. Okay, to make room for the requested item. Okay. And online caching algorithms obviously have no knowledge of the future. And that's, that's, it's a very simple framework. Okay. What we're going to do is compare the rate at which an online algorithm messes to that of the best prescient offline algorithm, one who has infinite computing power, one who sees the entire future, and no matter what the sequence is, can write down the optimal sequence of evictions. Okay. And so we'll call that the competitiveness of A. So the thing you can easily show, and this is uh, uh, an analysis of uh, an observation due to many people, but uh, best known due to Manas McGuin Slater, is that no deterministic online algorithm can beat competitiveness k. Okay? And the way you do that is just to have k plus one items and always request the item that the deterministic algorithm, caching algorithm, has left out of cache. So it's hit him where he ain't. Okay? And so the red box shows the k things in cache, the one thing that isn't. And by always requesting that uh, item, you can force the online algorithm to always miss, and you can get uh, an offline algorithm to make only one miss, uh, at most one miss in, in K requests. All right, so here's a nice algorithm due to Fiat, Karp, Luby, McHugh, Slater, and Young. Okay? And what they showed was an exponential improvement in the competitiveness due to randomization. And here's what they did. They showed that a randomized marking algorithm has competitiveness uh, something like two times the kth harmonic number. Okay? And here's what they do. What they say is, so it's important to understand the setup here. Uh, and I say this because uh, uh, shortly before this was published, Mark Smear and I got the, the order of quantifications wrong. Uh, and so, so this is the, the critical thing to observe. The adversary has to write down the request sequence in advance. Okay, and then the online algorithm flips coins and makes randomized choices. Okay, so what is the particular randomized choice or set of choices that algorithm makes? Uh, what they say is associate with each of the k cache locations a bit that can be set to one. Initially, everything is zero. It's unmarked. Okay? And then you start fielding the request. When an item in cache is hit, you mark it one. Uh, on a mess, you evict a randomized, uh, a random unmarked location, a random zero-bit location. Okay? When everything gets mar uh, marked, you unmark them all and start again. Okay? So why does this work? Well, intuitively, the reason this gets uh, that logarithmic factor is the adversary is trying to guess what's not in the cache. Okay? And essentially, the runs, until the adversary guesses correctly, uh, are you, you cover about half the cache marked before you take another guess and another guess and another guess. So that's what gives you this logarithmic behavior. Now that's an intuitive argument. That's not quite right. To prove this right, you have to uh, use potential functions and stuff. The key thing here is this is yet another instance where through an extremely simple idea, in this case, adding the marker bits and, and randomization, you get a dramatic improvement in algorithm performance. And this is one of the profound influences 
that Dick Krupp exerted on our community. Okay. All right, let me go to my third example, which if Wi-Fi were to work, oh, good. Okay. And it has to do with the power of deferral. Okay. And this uh, is actually a, it came, some work that came about from a homework exercise that, uh, that Dick Karp gave to us. And if you look at that, and say, if you look at this example and say, wow, my professor doesn't give me open problems as homework exercises, your professor is probably giving you too easy a time. Okay. Uh, so here's the, the, the question he gave uh, when uh, I was a second year student at Berkeley. Uh, so you're searching in a set of orderable elements. Think of them as integers, okay? So let's say you're given a set of n integers and a query, and you want to determine whether the query is in this set, okay? Um, so what are a couple of ways of doing it? Well, let's say you don't sort the set, then when a query comes in, you have to compare it exhaustively with every element in the set, okay? Um, alternatively, you might invest n log n steps to build a search tree, following which each query takes log n comparisons, right? So you're left with these two extrema. Do I not bother building a search tree and invest n comparisons for a search, or do I actually do the work up front, do the sorting, build a search tree, and then field queries at log n comparisons per query? Okay. And, and this is sort of the classic do I rent or buy skis paradox, because well, sort of a, a conundrum. Uh, because what if the number of queries is unknown up front? Is it worth sorting? I don't know how many queries I'm going to get on this data set. Uh, should I bother sorting or should I not? Okay. So in this case, you can show that an information theoretic lower bound, pretty straightforward, uh, has this number of comparisons. In other words, the number of comparisons you must invest in fielding our qu uh, queries on an unordered set of n elements on an ordered set of n elements, orderable set of n elements, is this thing here, right? It looks like n plus r log smaller one, okay? And you say, okay, is that matchable? And this is the homework question that we had, uh, that we were given, right? Um, so the question is this, without a priori knowledge of r, can we do optimal work for every r, right? Does the question make sense? Good, all right. Um, Here's what we did. This is joint work with uh, Rajiv Motwani, and uh, Dick eventually joined us to enhance the body of work and extend it to a whole bunch of other problems. Okay. And the idea is to build the search tree incrementally as queries arrive. And you can implement this in various ways. I'm going to show you one implementation. Right? What you do is, on the first query, you pick a random element in the set, okay? and then you partition it into two, two subsets, smaller and larger. Uh, and once you take the query, let's say it falls in smaller, you do the same thing and keep going down. Okay? So now you've answered the first query. Okay? And that's all. You stop there. You don't do further sorting. That's the partially built data structure. Okay? Now for each subsequent query, you follow the partially built search tree and keep building out the search tree. So you start with this gigantic blob and no tree, but as queries start to pound you, you start to fill out the search tree. Does that make sense? OK. Um, what you can show is that with extremely high uh, asymptotic probability, this matches the lower bound. Okay. So being lazy, not doing the work up front. Okay. Well, Cobb didn't tell us to be lazy, but um, the, the point of one of the things he always said was when doing analyses and often algorithm design, we are too often eager to bring everything up front and deal with the complexity. In fact, just pushing things out. And, and waiting can actually lead to, to better outcomes. And in this case, this kind of pushing the, the construction of the search tree out actually is asymptotically the right thing to do. Right? Make sense? OK. Uh, this was actually immortalized uh, by uh, the late Rajiv Motwani, who was a grad student with me. Uh, he said, well, what our paper shows is never do today what you can postpone to tomorrow. <laughs> right. My fourth anecdote comes, I call it everything's connected. Uh, one of those of us who were uh, students at that time, and Ellie was one of the people there, uh, one of the things we remember is some poor speaker would come from thousands of miles away and start giving this talk about this interesting new problem. And 
Carport put up his hand and say something essentially like, wait, wasn't that solved in 1953 already, right? And he would be able to make these deep connections between a seemingly new problem and something that had been solved in his, you know, uh, graduate student life or something. And it's very intimidating to stand up and give a talk in front of him, right? And he was able to perceive very deep connections. And I guess those of you who are familiar with reduction in combinatorial problems, well, yeah, that's what he did for a living. He, he connected problems up. Okay? Uh, the, the anecdote I'm going to give you is a form of connection that uh, I was a part of discovering. Okay? So the, the problem that we're going to look at is given an undirected graph and very little memory, to decide whether two nodes S and T are connected. Okay? Uh, the, the first break in this came in, in the late 70s in a paper by Alenilas, Karp, Lipton, Lobas, and Rakoff. Okay? And they essentially showed, showed that with logarithmic space, you can probabilistically determine such connectivity. Okay? Uh, now, you look at that and get, go, come on, that sounds pretty easy. Remember, we are now almost 40 years later, but back then, this was the state of the art. Okay, Savage had just about proven his theorem, uh, and this is like the state of the art in space-bounded computation. Okay? And uh, so the algorithm was simple. You start from S, do a random walk for a while, and after run, running about n cubed steps, if you don't hit T, you just repeat. And the probability of failure in any run is less than a half. You can telescope that out, and life is happy. Right? So what this did was uh, it initiated a cottage industry in, in the whole study of random walks in, in uh, the theoretical computer science community, which I think was actually rich because it led to an entire new set of, uh, new level of understanding of random walks that came to be used in many, many different ways uh, uh, in algorithms in computer science. Okay. Uh, I was a small part of this, and I'm going to show you one unexpected uh, connection that we discovered, and it was really inspired by this work of Alain Lienas et al. Okay? Uh, and I call this the pièce de résistance. So, so here's an unexpected connection. Okay? So we were looking at the lengths of random walks. So we asked the question, what is the expected length of a random walk in a graph from a node S to a node T and back to node S? We call, the, call it the commute time. Okay? It turns out, uh, so Larry Russo and I uh, spent many weeks studying this, and various other colleagues joined us. This was in the group of Ashok Chandra at IBM. And Roman Smolensky was walking by one day, and he looks at the board and said, what are you guys doing? And he said, we're trying to study this random walk commute time. And he said, well, I bet it's the resistance, and he walked away. And that was his contribution to the paper. Okay? This was like literally a drive-by uh, you know, uh, result proving. And he turned out to be absolutely right. So here's the amazing connection. Uh, which is that if you look at the graph as a bunch of resistance of one ohm where each edge sits, and you measure the resistance between S and T, that exactly characterizes the commute time. And that's an exact equality. This is not a bound. This is one of those things that matches up tightly. right? Um, and it's one of those things where uh, we went and explained this to Dick Karp, and he was on the one hand, gracious, and said, oh, yeah, this is very beautiful. But then he also says, it follows immediately from the fact that both are Laplace and matrices. I'm like, OK, you know, thank you. It follows Im immediately. But it felt like a great result to us. Right? Uh, and it really is because both of these processes are governed by the same linear system. OK, now I'm going to come to my, uh, oh, and by the way, if you want to study more on this, look at the Doyle and Snell monograph. It's about 90 pages that connect random walks and electric networks. It's, Amazing. Now, I'm going to come to my last uh, vignette here. And uh, some of you know the answer to this question, so please don't answer. But uh, if I were to ask you which paper of COP is the most cited, okay, most of you would probably think of reducibility amongst combinatorial problems in 1971. And the answer is no, that is not his most cited paper. Okay. Uh, the, the setting in which I discovered that there is a different more cited paper is one that to me was always weird because uh, Dick was kind of the ultimate theoretician, but at the same time, uh, he had this uncanny knack for getting in the way of things that were useful. So somehow he managed to practice utility even though he preached theory. Okay. Uh, and uh, the setting in which uh, uh, this comes about is actually originally inspired by Napster 
How many people here remember Napster? Okay, Jesus, depressing. Okay, Napster was a peer-to-peer peer -peer, uh, music sharing service where people could make copies of files. There were later editions uh, in different incarnations. Various de justice departments tried to shut them down, and some form of it survives today as well. Okay, uh, but for a while, peer-to-peer -peer networks were the thing, and um, a bunch of groups started studying these things, and this actually profoundly influenced the way distributed hash tables involved. And I'll, I'll say how in a second. Okay. So what are DHTs? They're an important primitive in large-scale distributed computing. Okay. So you get these objects, call them files, and they get you know, mapped to a server node. So to give some idea of sizes, well, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. So the, you have these things called files. Think of them as lots and lots of them. You have lots of these nodes called servers. They're connected up. Okay. Uh, servers sit in data centers, there's all sorts of recursions in there. But um, the basic primitives are that you want to access files, you want to create files, and nodes arrive and leave unpredictably, so servers can die. Okay? And system design calls for a few things. First, you want this to be scalable, you want it to be extensible. You want good performance for reaching files from anywhere, and I'll tell you why in actually uh, really important application is now. And you want this to be simple, something that when it starts to break, you can quickly diagnose and, and get back in shape. Okay. All right, so a, a fundamental uh, step towards this was this paper by Ratnasamy, Francis Handley, Karp, and Schenker, the idea of content addressable networks. Like uh, I was saying, there were several projects that sim simultaneously converged on these ideas. And uh, I think John was telling me yesterday that uh, Everybody cites all of these different projects, but they've all had a very prof profound influence on how we store and distribute data today. Okay. So what's the idea in CAN, right? So think of a d-dimensional torus, okay? And this torus is, is topologically continuous and all of that. So every node that exists, every server, is mapped to a random point in this d-dimensional torus. And it owns, uh, think of it as a rectilinear Voronoi-ish zone around itself. Right? It's not actually Voronoi, but you know, that's a good way to start thinking about it. Okay? Now, a file is stored at the node whose zone contains its hash value. So you hash the file as well, it'll, you'll drop it in a zone. OK, that's the server where it's going to, store, to be stored. In practice, you don't store it only at one place. You store you know, master copies and witness copies and all of that. But that's for the purposes of this quick description. Think of it as being stored at one node. right? All right, um, when you want to access a file, you do essentially a greedy Manhattan routing on the torus through these zones, okay? And to, what's nice about this is that every node need only maintain a constant number of neighbors. The way they set up zones, uh, and I'll give you a little hint now, uh, can be done so that only everybody has only a small number of neighbors, okay? Now, zones will sometimes be split because if you add new servers, for instance, a new server gets hashed into a zone belonging to another server, then they divvy up that space into two subspaces, right? and they continue. Right? And if you do the divvying up carefully, you maintain the constant neighborhood property. Okay? And you have to uh, update the routing tables only locally and so on. Okay? Now, if you then want to make this highly re reliable and available, what you actually do is you overlay multiple toric spaces, so you don't have only one torus. Uh, you have multiple hash functions, and you get a very robust large-scale system for distributing data. Uh, you say, okay, that was Napster, I don't know, circa 2000 or whatever it was. Who cares about it now? Uh, it, it matters uh, deeply. So let me give you a couple of examples, one of which gives you a feel for the numbers. Uh, you may be thinking that I'm giving you this talk off of this laptop, but I'm not actually. My slides sit in the cloud, and this is one of the things I said to Alessandro. There's no way I can give my talk in Italy because Wi-Fi never works there. But uh, he proved me wrong. Wi-Fi works beautifully. So each time I click here, my machine is actually sending a request out to multiple Google data centers, uh, getting enough witness copies to present me with the next slide. Okay? So there is nothing on my machine here. Okay? And it's using actually a protocol not that different from what I'm showing you here. Okay? Uh, to give you a sense of objects uh, and sizes, uh, think of the f number of files in the range of a trillion okay? and the number of nodes in the range of tens of millions. Okay. So that's sort of the scale at which we're doing this. And, and this stuff actually seems to work. Okay. So 
so again, back to the question, was there utility to, to Dick's work? Because he's such a consummate theoretician. Yeah, actually, uh, it, it does work. It sits in places like this that uh, you and I don't normally get to see. But uh, it's true. It, it all gets together. OK, so with that, I think I'll stop. Uh, I think Bellini are overdue. And now I want, I'd like to invite Alessandro to come and give us directions on how to get there. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Questions? That is not vision. Retro. 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 Okay, yes. Okay, another question. <clears throat> the, um, just curious, on the numbers for uh, the one, tr one trillion files, so that, that's in all cloud storage? Or is, I, I was just curious sorry, how to calibrate the one trillion number. Uh, I have to believe all cloud storage is more than that. Uh, the, my, my day job includes taking care of things like Google Drive, so you can guess where that uh, number came from. Uh, so yeah, uh, if you look at just Drive files, it's of that order of magnitude. If you look at uh, Gmail objects, it's obviously a much larger number uh, than, than that. Yeah. But, but you know, the way Gmail is sharded is not into individual files by user, but drive objects are in fact sharded that way at the file level. Another area where utility in the carp and the power of algorithms and so on is computational biology. Do you, do you have any comments about? I mean, he was one of the early pioneers there, but that's right. Moved uh, out of it. Dick was absolutely an early pioneer uh, in in computational biology, a subject that I. Uh, know so little about that I didn't uh, dare open my mouth about it. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I will say what I can see of it is the movement lives on. Uh, and Dick made many friends in the biology side, which is, I think, one of the things he taught us with people like Leroy Hood and Craig, Craig Manto, who were actually people he quoted. And because of that, uh, the field moved forward. Uh, I think Dick personally got a little disillusioned and left the field. More questions? So I have a question myself uh, <laughs> before okay. Bellini. Um, so do you think that uh, because of the success of uh, things such as deep learning, this particular vision of doing research is under attack or is in danger? Or under, or, I mean, is there a danger that is going to be underappreciated? Uh, I think we have to give things more time. Uh, uh, one of the, the most entertaining pieces of uh, the, one of the best talks at uh, Cobb's 80th birthday was by Don Knuth. Uh, and, and Knuth actually read, as you would expect Knuth to do, he read Cobb's PhD thesis. And at the end, he finds this program that's, a, I think, a Burroughs uh, assembler program with obviously no commenting or any reference to what it was about. So Knuth being Knuth went on the web, got the Burroughs assembler language, managed to, to uh, reverse engineer the whole thing, and decided it was a Euclidean GCD algorithm, and then found a bug in it. Uh, it was pretty amazing. Now, the reason I mentioned that story uh, is if you think back to the late 50s, Euclidean GCD was like the frontier of computation and barely understandable. And this was, you know, polynomial time didn't exist at that time. Or you know, we didn't think it mattered, right? Uh, so Jack Edmonds comes along and says, no, this is important, right? Uh, so in similar fashion, the fact that we don't understand neural nets today, uh, and yet they do something, is not reason to be discouraged and walk away from them, right? Uh, so, uh, I think it uh, makes new demands on us to, to study these phenomena harder. Uh, so thank you. Let's thank the speaker again.